Welcome back to Hard Money. Joining me now is James Check. He goes by Check Matey on Twitter, and he is the lead analyst at Glassnode. James, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Natalie, great to be here. Well, James, you are a vocal critic of the Ethereum merge, which is shifting the cryptocurrency's consensus mechanism from proof of work to proof of stake. So first off, I want to ask you, James, what is the difference between proof of work and proof of stake? And if you can, explain it in a way that we can share this definition with our parents and grandparents. For sure. So, so proof of work and proof of stake are essentially consensus mechanisms. They're ways that the blockchain come to, I guess, the agreement uh, on what is truth, uh, what has happened in the past, and essentially agreeing on the history as it as it, uh, as it forms. Now, proof of work is a uh, it's a mechanism that essentially requires some form of external input cost. So, in this instance, when we look at Bitcoin mining, um, they essentially must burn power, and by burning that power, there's no other way to forge that particular consensus level. So, you, you can prove um, in a, in a fairly trivial way with cryptography that that work has been completed. And I use the analogy of someone who goes to the gym. If someone's been going to the gym for, uh, for you know, 10 years and they're quite fit, you can look at them immediately and that you don't have to ask them the question. You know that they've been to the gym. Um, proof of stake is a more, uh, it's a slightly more complex, uh, certainly in the, the technical realm, uh, consensus mechanism. And it essentially uses the existing coin supply and those who have the coin supply um, to essentially verify each other's transactions. And the idea there is that you're putting something up as a, you know, as a stake. Um, and if you misbehave, that gets taken away from you. So it's a more of an internally uh, consistent system. So rather than having an external input cost as your verification me uh, mechanism, it's essentially relying upon, you know, those who have the, uh, the wealth within the system, they essentially form that same validator pool. So it is a slightly, they're, they're different systems um, and they do have uh, pros and cons in different, uh, different regions, but that's the, the general gist. One is an external uh, function and one is purely an internal function. Well, that's a great way to define those. Can you talk to us about some of your concerns? And I think one of the biggest is, will the Ethereum merge make that cryptocurrency more centralized? Um, in terms of the, the centralization process, um, we, we tend to find that proof of work uh, is a lot more capitalistic. There is a, uh, there is a competition um, and essentially is a, a constant, uh, almost like an arms race for the newest hardware that, you know, trying to be front of the curve and making correct capital decisions at the correct time for, for uh, Bitcoin miners. So we see a lot of churn. You can't essentially uh, get to the top of the food chain and stay there. Um, in a proof of stake system, it's a little bit more complex. And um, in particular, for a number of reasons, hu human beings like convenience and we like to delegate risk. Uh, and as a result, people will tend to want to stake their coins on places like Coinbase, places like, uh, like Kraken, so centralized exchanges. And there's also a handful of services, uh, one being uh, Lido. There's another one called Rocket Pool. These are trying to be more decentralized, um, uh, you know, multiple node operators, but they also have their own challenges, you know, having a token and therefore they have a, a governance structure. So generally what we see is that uh, proof of stake systems tend to see coins centralized. We also over time see that just capital in general tends to centralize. Um, those who have economies of scale in a proof of stake system tend to have a lot more um, in terms of the, uh, the overall say. And really the challenge of this comes down to you, you do have a, a greater centralization in my view um, of the validator network. So then the next question is, is that really a problem? So in a proof of work system, um, yes, you can see some of these mining operations, you know, they're, they're very, very large, they consume large amounts of power, but power is also geographically distributed. So you have these miners located all over the world um, and the incentive to find the cheapest power means that they will move to places like stranded landfills. They will move to, um, you know, geothermal in, in Iceland. They'll move all over the place. What we've seen to date, and this is just purely empirical, is that a vast majority of the Ethereum stake is about over 70% of that stake now, um, we know is in a US regulated entity um, that has some kind of you know, a fit, you know, VC funding or is just a company that's literally based in the, in the US. So the, it's, it's more the jurisdictional and geographical risk. Um, and you know, there's a whole plethora of things on, on what that centralization actually means and kind of the ramifications, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stop there for now. Well, in what ways does this sort of mimic the current fiat system that we have so many problems with that led to the creation of things like Bitcoin? There is definitely, and in my view, there is a uh, there is a degree of um, uh, politicization of, of proof of stake. 
Um, and that's okay. Again, it comes down to the, the pros and cons of these things. Um, proof of stake, generally speaking, it, the way that I view these things, uh, because it does introduce that political layer, it introduces that, um, you know, capital essentially provides power um, in, in a sense. Um, it, it does move further down that political realm. And that may be okay for things like financial rails, for example. So for example, we're moving around things like a stable coin. Those stable coins have centralized issuers anyway. So do you need ultimate decentralization at the base layer? It becomes less important. So if the things that you're supporting are not quite as decentralized, uh, then you can in fact have a not quite as decentralized base layer. When we move to something like a, a raw money that is trying to actually compete with the fiat system um, where, where Bitcoin sits, then yes, you absolutely need that, uh, that jurisdictional risk. And you need, as we say in Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin is for enemies. You actually need your enemies to be miners as well. So that incentive of power, um, literally power being, uh, being uh, widely dispersed around the world is beneficial for a hard money type system. If you're looking at financial rails moving around semi-centralized systems anyway, you can have a slightly more cent uh, a slightly more centralized mechanism like proof of stake. Um, that you know the benefits may well uh, account for that. You know we have so many cryptocurrencies out there. I think the latest count was about twenty thousand. It's a very difficult space for newbies to navigate. So how does Ethereum differentiate itself from other proof of stake coins such as Solana, Cardano? Yeah, so this is a, this is actually a very very good question, um, and it's it's something that I certainly raise uh, as just just a question mark, I suppose, uh, for the project, um, and that is what exactly is the edge um, that uh, Ethereum has as it moves to proof of stake. Um, in my view, when I look at the field, and you can actually see this, there's the vast majority of tokens, um, the uh, blockchains that is, um, they are proof of stake. So it is much easier to spin up a new proof of stake uh, blockchain network. Uh, because the bootstrapping of a proof of work network is hard. And uh, we tend to see that proof of work is a winner take all market. Uh, it's very hard to navigate the gauntlet up through CPUs to GPUs um, until you get to, uh, to ASICs. It is a very, very hard uh, path for any of these coins to run. Um, so generally, we actually see that proof of stake um, tends to be the preferred mechanism. And when we really boil it down, you know, we, we, there is kind of two key arguments that, uh, that is hosted on the Ethereum website and what the, the general proponents for proof of stake uh, will, will, will come to. Um, the first one is uh, the environmental concerns, um, which you know um, I personally don't fall in the camp where that is a, is a valid critique. Um, when you look at uh, proof of work, there's actually a lot of externalities that are gonna be extremely positive for the environment, flaring methane, gas, and all that kind of thing. Um, but the other one is a technical argument, which is the scalability, um, the, the future of sharding. So. Um, that really is kind of the primary reason, in my view, that they're, they're moving to proof of stake. Um, it's the primary one that has kind of uh, legs as, a, as an argument. The challenge is that what we I mean, what that's trying to do is split the Ethereum blockchain to many, many blockchains um, to aid with scalability, right? Pushing data to, to further layers. The challenge with that system um, is that it's going to take a lot of time. Um, it's, it's many years away from, from fruition. And in the meantime, that scalability is going to essentially be much the same. So gas fees we've seen have not come down um, and that was never expected uh, post the merge, but users don't necessarily wanna pay large gas fees. So there's almost a bit of an arms race for Ethereum. It, it will need to innovate quite quickly in my view, because it's now in a realm where there's lots of competition in proof of stake. Um, it hasn't yet achieved that, you know, it, it's obviously got the network effects as they stand, but network effects can erode if they don't get that scalability going because people just simply will move to cheaper blockchains. And this is essentially what we saw uh, in, in the bull run last year. So, um, you know, it, it's definitely an arms race and uh, they're in a, in a, you know, they're a big fish in a, in a large tank now. Um, but there are other fish who are growing in that particular pond. In my view, staying proof of work actually would have kept Ethereum as one of the most um, unique blockchains because essentially it's a winner-take-all system, um, and uh, you know it would have been the only smart contract chain that could have had that proof of work backbone. So um, I think it was a missed opportunity to actually stay proof of work, but uh, it's a you know we will see how these things play out over the long term. You make some really interesting points, and I want to come back around to what you mentioned about the environmental narrative. But first, you made a very compelling video critiquing the Ethereum merge on August 13th. You state EIP-1559 is a major blunder at the social governance level, which pits ETH holders against Ethereum network users. Can you explain this line? What did you mean by everything that's in this chart? 
Yeah, so um, so EIP fifteen fifty nine was kind of the first implementation of, of this burning mechanism, uh, and the idea here is that some portion of the transaction fee goes to actually uh, it, it's burnt. It, it essentially gets removed from the supply. Um, and there's look, there's a lot of layers to this. Um, it, it's it, it's one of those things that you know th these things can take a long time to play out. And again, um, I, I could very well be wrong in my in my assessment of this, but. Uh, when I generally play out the, the game theory of what happens, right? Because in a proof of stake system, your objective essentially is to grow your share of the pie. Now that pie in a, when you have a burning mechanism can change shape by a few mechanisms. You can either obviously buy or sell your coins, or you can actually have the pie change if you're burning some portion of the supply. So if we take the, the fundamental case that in, in proof of work, when you spend your coins, um, or you, um, you know, perform a transaction, your fees go to the miner, the miner has to burn energy to get those fees. So over the long arc of time, they effectively have to sell the vast majority of it. So it's almost a transfer of, of fee, you get the service from that transaction fee, and it goes to somebody else because the miner had to sell it or the vast majority of it. Um, once you introduce a burning mechanism, you don't have to do anything, you can essentially sit there and, and do nothing with your coins and your share of the stake will go up. Now, in a proof of work system, that's that's more or less fine because there's no that the the share of the network to your governance power in the system. Once you move to a proof of stake system, however, if you essentially sit there and do nothing, so let's call this the ETH holders or the ETH stakers, where they're actually also staking their coins, you are going to see that you don't have to do anything, and your share of the pie will go up if you move into a deflationary regime. So users of the network are in a way diluting themselves out of the system. It's fine because they get the service that they're paying the transaction fee for, but their stake has now declined. And that's generally a net negative in a proof of stake system. So by doing nothing, you're essentially growing your share of the pie. But because of all the incentives that we discussed at the beginning, the convenience and delegation of risk, um, we've seen this with Coinbase. They recently rolled out their what we call liquid staking derivative. This is a token that represents staked ETH. There is a very, very high probability that these liquid staking derivatives will come from Kraken and Coinbase and Binance, um, and then also Lido and these other groups. And the idea is that you will essentially not want to be not staking, if that makes sense. So um, there's no incentive to, to not be a staker. You essentially want to hold one of these liquid staking derivatives rather than the, the base currency ETH more than the, what you need for fees. And as a result, if everybody is a staker, that means that everybody's share who's not doing anything in the system, the holders can actually grow in terms of their wealth because the price can go up. The holders of ETH tokens can see their value go up, but the market cap, which I tend to view as market cap is the representation of the network's value to society. If you're burning supply, because market cap is supply times price, your price can go up, but your supply can go down by an equal amount. So the existing holders can get wealthier whilst diluting out users of the system and simultaneously not provide any value for society because the market cap could go sideways or down. So there's actually a disconnect between the value creation and the wealth creation for existing holders. And if you run this experiment out, again, there, there's a lot of theory in here. There's a lot of variables. But um, in my view, if you run this game theory out over a long term, you've essentially imposed a tax on users of the system to enrich people who essentially are existing holders. So the earlier you get into this game and the more you just sit tight and do nothing, um, the more that you will benefit. And then you layer in the proof of stake layer, which is the, the political um, and, and essentially the validation power. And it can just be a real concentrator for wealth and, and power within that system. So again, it's a very, very big problem. We'll see how it plays out. Um, but in, in my view, there's a few layers there that just don't quite gel with what I think is a long-term sustainable, uh, sustainable factor. Right. Well, that does sound very concerning and very similar to our Cantillon effect fiat system. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about with you, James, is Bitcoin sort of versus Ethereum and the narratives that are out there. Some people think that Bitcoin and Ethereum can peacefully coexist and others think this is a zero sum game. So do you think that Bitcoiners will have to defend Bitcoin against claims that Ethereum is much more environmentally friendly and thus should be the blockchain that the U.S. even on a federal level supports? What do you see happening? 
Yeah, I mean the the Bitcoin versus Ethereum thing is a, is a tired old argument, and it's you know th th there's so many better things we could do be doing with our time. Um, you know, there is sadly probably going to be uh, a great deal of campaigns. I certainly hope that there isn't, but uh, I, I do sense that there will be a lot of campaigns against Bitcoin's proof of work as a result of this. Um, you know, we've we've already seen some of Bitcoin's largest critics. There's the the Digiconomist website, for example, which is uh, well funded by central bankers. Um, and essentially has been, uh, you know, um, pouring the dirt on Bitcoin's proof of work dishonestly in, in many ways for, for many years. Um, and, you know, they, they are now themselves preaching, look how wonderful proof of stake is. But the, the trade-offs there just don't make sense. So I, I'm in the camp where both Ethereum and Bitcoin have, uh, they have their own place. Um, I don't believe that Ethereum competes on the, on the sound money um, front. So I, I just, just don't think there's a, there's a comp competition there um, for a number of layers, uh, you know, proof of stake being one, um, you know, coin supplies, all these types of things. It's, but overall, um, they serve different purposes, right? I, I view Ethereum as a, some degree of financial rails, um, something that allows you to move stable coins around, right? The, the, these are all good functions and they serve a purpose. Um, but, you know, the, the, the tension that Ethereum is created between being a monetary asset and a gas, essentially, for a financial system, that tension, I think you, you kind of have to pick one horse. I don't think you can ride both of those horses at the same time. Um, Bitcoin chose to ride the uh, the hard money stance and all of its trade-offs represent and reflect that. With Ethereum, um, because they're trying to do the hard money and the gas, they are essentially trying to ride too many horses at once and, and there are going to be conflicting, uh, conflicting realities down the line. I think they serve different purposes. Um, I wish that people spent better time than, than arguing over which one was better. Um, I think that if we talk about the nuances and how they actually separate each other and they, they do different things. Um, we would have a far more productive uh, conversation, but uh, um, you know, overall, I think they're going to coexist and uh, you know, I, I just think that they compete on different playing grounds uh, over the long term. We hope you enjoyed that interview. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our new YouTube page so you don't miss out on any hard money content.